Hello everyone, I'm Lynn Holtain from the Victoria Law Foundation and together with the University of California Irvine Law Civil Justice Research Initiative, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session of the International Access to Justice Online Forum. Today talking about culturally appropriate service design and delivery. This is a session I'm really looking forward to and I'm sure you are too. It is my privilege to acknowledge the law and the law of First Nations peoples everywhere and to tell you that today I'm on Bunwarang country, lands of the Kulin Nation in southeastern Australia. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, recognising their abiding connection to land, waterways and community and that these lands were never ceded. It's my privilege to pay respect to Bunwarang elders and to elders from other nations with us today and to all the generations who have nurtured this land for over 50,000 years and continue to do so. So terrific to have you with us today for this session and an extraordinary array of, of international perspectives on culturally appropriate service design and delivery. I'll introduce you to our speakers in just a moment. A couple of housekeeping matters first. It's a webinar, so only panellists can be seen and heard. But please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask your questions or to upvote other people's questions, and there'll be time to get to these at the end of the presentations. Towards the end of the session, we are going to post a link to the next one, which, if you're staying with us, is on courts and COVID, which is another area of, of significant international uh, attention, as you can imagine, we'll put that in the chat function so that if you want to slide straight through to the next function, all you have to do is, is click there. Or you can stay with us till the end of, of this session. And if you want to go on to, to courts and COVID, just go to the program and click on the session link there and it will take you direct into that webinar. But without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers today. We have with us Aaron Drake, Associate Professor and Associate Dean at Osgoode Hall Law School in York, University in Canada. We also have Mihiata Pirini, who's a law lecturer at the University of Otago, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Leanne Carter, who's the statewide community justice program leader at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service based in Melbourne. We have as our facilitator, Melanie Schwartz, uh, very grateful to have Melanie with us also, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And Melanie will pick up Q&A a little later. But to kick us off, let me uh, pass now the baton to Karen Drake from York University in Canada for our first session. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. Ani, bonjour, hello. Karen Drake and Dishnakaz, Wabagoni, Sagagan, and Ishnabek, and Donjaba, Toronto, Inda. I'm, my name is Karen Drake. I'm a member of the Wabagun Lake Ojibwe Nation, and I'm speaking to you from Toronto, Canada. And I'm very grateful to be able to make my livelihood and live my life here in the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, which is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon wampum. Okay, so to start, I'm going to share my screen. So thank you so much to the organizers of this event for the invitation to contribute to this panel discussion. And I'm very grateful to each of you for this opportunity to engage with you. What I wanna focus on today are attempts to import indigenous dispute resolution procedures into court processes. So for example, in Canada, it's very common to use talking circles in sentencing or in criminal diversion processes. Or in a civil file, it's possible to use a talking circle as a form of mediation. So my thesis today is that these kinds of hybrid approaches, which merely add elements of Indigenous processes to existing court procedures, don't go far enough. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that these hybrid approaches don't have value or that we shouldn't pursue them. I absolutely agree that it's better to make incremental progress rather than no progress at all. But my goal is to encourage us to not be satisfied with just a hybrid approach and instead to continue to work towards implementing fully Indigenous dispute resolution procedures because my concern is that hybrid procedures can result in perhaps a superficial or even a distorted application of indigenous procedures. Uh, 
Now, to avoid a pan-Indigenous approach today, I'm going to focus on Anishinaabe law and Anishinaabe constitutionalism, because that's my nation. As I said, I'm a member of the Wabigun Lake Ojibwe Nation, which is part of the Anishinaabe Nation. And because I'm drawing on the work of Aaron Mills. Aaron Mills is Anishinaabe, he is an assistant professor, and he holds the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Constitutionalism and Philosophy at University of McGill's Faculty of Law. Okay, so Professor Mills conceptualizes a legal system using a tree model of legality. Now this model applies equally to Indigenous legal orders and to liberal legal orders as well. And so we can picture two trees standing next to each other. One represents a Canadian or liberal legal system and one represents an Anishinaabe legal system. Now he compares the laws of a legal system to the leaves or needles of a tree. And the Anishinaabe term here is Anakinagawin. Now the leaves or the needles are not the entirety of the tree and the laws are not the entirety of a legal order. To fully understand the leaves or needles, we must first understand the levels below. So that brings us to the level of the roots, which represent a society's worldview, including its epistemology or ways of knowing, its ontology or its view of what there is in the world and its cosmology, or in other words, it's the story that it tells of creation. Now, starting first with an Anishinaabe worldview, here, we start with the premise that creation is imbued with inherent normative order. And in particular, the notion that everything we need to live a good life is given to us as a gift from the natural world. Now, from this principle, we take the norm that we have a responsibility to identify, develop, and use our own unique gifts, including both our sacred gifts, but also just our ordinary gifts of knowledge, skill, and labor, just as the earth gives its gifts to us. And this principle is sometimes referred to as the great law or the original instructions. Now, none of us has all the gifts we need to be self-sustaining. So not even the richest person in the world, not even Jeff Bezos or whoever that is that is the richest person in the world. They might have all of the material gifts they need to be self-sustaining, but they don't have all of the spiritual, emotional, or intellectual gifts to be self-sustaining. And so we are each radically interdependent with each other. Now we can contrast this with a liberal worldview. And here, what's at the foundation of liberalism is not a recognition of what is unique to each of us or our unique gifts, but rather a claim about what is common to each of us. And that's the inherent dignity of the human person. So instead of having a responsibility to give gifts within liberalism, Liberalism protects the principle that each individual human is entitled to define, pursue, and revise their own conception of the good life. In other words, according to liberalism, we're each entitled to delineate our own individual original instructions. And so here we see reflected in this core principle of liberalism, the primacy of the individual, and especially the autonomy of the individual. Now, according to liberalism, our society's laws do not adhere in the natural world as they do within an Ishtabe constitutionalism. Instead, they find their source in human institutions, such as the legislative and judicial branches of government. Moving up, we come to the trunk, which represents a society's constitutional order. Now, when we hear this phrase, constitutional order or constitutionalism, we might initially think of a political order where government powers are legally constrained. Now, that's a feature of one particular kind of constitutionalism. But we can understand the concept of constitutionalism more broadly as referring to a framework for how a community constitutes itself as a political entity. So speaking first about an Anishinaabe constitutional order, the logic here is the logic of mutual aid. And the conceptual architecture of mutual aid is that of gifts and needs. Now, the core tenet of a mutual aid framework is this notion that we each have a responsibility to identify, develop, and use our own gifts to meet the needs of others. This in turn entails responsibilities to identify the needs of others as well as their gifts. Now, giving a gift generates gratitude, which generates reciprocity, which generates the giving of further gifts, and so on. 
In other words, the logic of mutual aid is cyclical. Now we can contrast this with the logic of a liberal constitutional order, which is that of contract or consent. And here, the normative architecture is that of rights and duties. Now, I suspect that the appearance of the term responsibility within an Ishtabi constitutionalism sometimes leads one to assume that a rights discourse can be easily imported into an Ishtabi constitutionalism because the notion of responsibility in the English language is often taken as a synonym for the notion of duty or obligation. What I want to emphasize though, is that the discourse of rights and duties only inheres within liberalism. It has no purchase within an Ishtabi constitutionalism. Instead, as I said, the logic there is that of gifts and needs. Now, moving up, we come to the level of the branches which represent legal institutions and processes. So these are the institutions we use to create, sustain, and unmake law. Now, within a liberal system, law's force is external to us insofar as the state exercises coercive authority over the individual in order to enforce laws. We can contrast this with an Ishtabe constitutionalism, where law's force comes from persuasive compliance, not coercion. And persuasive compliance comes from the practice of community members being persuaded to voluntarily accept a given norm for oneself. In other words, law's force within Ishtabe constitutionalism is internal rather than external as it is for liberalism. Okay, so the key to this tree model of legality is that each level shapes and constrains the one above it. In other words, the roots of a pine tree can only ever produce a pine trunk. Pine roots will never produce the trunk of a birch tree. And so if we try to take a leaf from a birch tree and paste it onto a pine tree, it won't work, it won't grow. Similarly, if we try to take indigenous dispute resolution procedures at the level of branches, and apply them using the worldview, the logic, and the constitutional norms of a common law system, it won't work. The result will be that the indigenous procedures will be distorted and applied incorrectly. Okay, so now I want to focus a little bit more on the level of the branches, in, in particular, legal institutions and processes. And what I have in mind here are the use of talking circles. And procedures for talking circles vary depending on the community and the purpose of the circle. So I'm just gonna speak about some of the procedures for talking circles that I'm familiar with. Now, one procedure is that each person in the circle has an opportunity to speak when it's their turn and no one is required to speak. Now, when you do speak, participants are encouraged to speak from the heart, as opposed to speaking through the filters of causes of actions or defenses. Now, when someone speaks, as long as they're holding the object, they're not interrupted. So this is unlike objections that are made in court. What this means, the person who's speaking and holds the object is not interrupted. It means that the person can speak for as long as they need. Now we can see this as being very different from a liberal legal system where parties are essentially forced to speak through their lawyers and through the architecture of the law and where factums and other submissions have strict page limits. And for instance, appellate courts, at least in Canada, can set time limits as, uh, as little as five minutes, right? So interveners, for instance, as the Supreme Court of Canada have as little as five minutes to make their submissions. Now in contrast, when we say to someone that we will sit here and listen to you for as long as you need. That's very powerful. It's a very powerful way to validate someone and their concerns. And often this kind of validation is exactly what's needed in order to restore relationships based on mutual aid. Okay, so to bring this to a conclusion, we can hold a mediation in uh, a circle but unless each and every participant in the circle is governing themselves in accordance with radical interdependence and mutual aid and persuasive compliance, then we'll just be engaged in a liberal form of mediation while our chairs happen to be set up in a circle. If we want to truly use Indigenous dispute resolution procedures, we need to first support participants in the process of internalizing the worldview and constitutional principles of the relevant Indigenous nation. Miigwech, thank you.
So we'll pass now to our next speaker, Piata Rini. Kia ora, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here. My name is Mihiata. I'm based in the University of Otago. My iwi are Ngāti Tuwhiritō and Whakatoi here. Um, and today I'm going to be speaking about insights from a design-led investigation into the Māori land court and its users. Um, obviously, this is a specific court and a specific piece of research, but I'll try and draw out some general insights relevant to the broader theme of culturally appropriate court design with uh, the emphasis on that word, especially design. So um, the research took place in 2019 to 2020 as part of my master's thesis. And my aim was to explore whether we can apply ideas and practices from the field of design to help understand the relationship between the Maori land court and those who use it. So some of you or many of you may be aware that uh, many of us in the legal field, commentators, academics, lawyers, are becoming increasingly interested in the potential value of design ideas and concepts and practices from design and whether they can help us address some of those thorny issues, particularly around access to justice. Um, what new legal services can we design to meet unmet legal need? What new legal tech can we design to, to help make sure that everyone has access to, to legal advice or particular legal services? Um, there are global hackathons happening where people are designing a piece of new legal tech. Um, we have prominent um, centers based in law schools like the Legal Design Lab at Stanford, which is explicitly bringing those fields of law and design together. Methodology of design thinking is widely talked about um, a methodology for doing design that might help uh, create informative, uh, innovative and transformative um, services. Um, so bringing those things into law at the moment, and we are seeing the emergence of um, this field of legal design, which Amanda Perry Kesseris defines as anywhere where we are seeing the deployment of design based methods and attitudes into law. So um, the promises of design are really attractive and appear to merit further exploration in some spaces in law. My aim was to explore the value of some of those design concepts and practices, um, specifically in the space of the Māori Land Court. So very briefly, the Māori Land Court, this is an image from inside the courtroom. It's a specialist uh, court established by statute and its overall function is to oversee the use of Māori land. So whenever an owner of Māori land wants to do something with that land, whether it be build a structure on it, um, put the land into trust, even to pass their interest in the land onto their descendants, all of that has to be the subject of an application that's brought before the Māori land court and signed off. So Māori land is a specific category, a statutory category of land that exists and is regulated by statute. Um, the reason this category of land exists is because there's so little Māori land left, so little land in New Zealand which is left in the hands of Māori. Um, obviously before colonisation and the arrival of the British, all land across the country was held by Māori according to customary forms of ownership and possession. Um, over time, most of that land uh, was subjected to individualization and has been sold off to settlers. But we still have this, this small category of land which is defined as Māori land and it makes up about 5% of land across the country. So anyone who owns that kind of land and it's all owned by Māori um, uh, must bring applications before the court if they want to use that land in any particular way. So that's essentially the overall function of that Māori land court. Um, so I was very interested, as, as I said, in considering whether these design, some of these design-based methods and attitudes can help us understand the relationship between the Māori land court and those who use it. So I was really interested in that relationship. Now, 
design is obviously a massive field. Um, and so I looked for specific concepts and practices from design that I could apply to the Māori land court. And I ended up with basically two, two broad areas where I tried to take design and I applied it to the court to investigate that relationship between the court and its users. The first is in the research methodology I used. So I used a creative research method aimed at generating insights into users' existing experiences and their hopes for the future. So I had seven participants in my research, people who had recently used the Māori Land Court, and I asked them to make something that reflected their experience of the court and their hopes for what that experience might ideally look like, and then to talk with me about what they made. This um, is called a creative research method because it asks participants to create something and it's drawn from Sanders and Stapper's um, convivial toolbox, generative research for the front end of design. One of the key theories um, underpinning this kind of creative research or generative research is that um, we can research someone's experience with, um, let's call it a design artifact. So when I talk about an artifact, I mean a product of design. So we might describe a court as a, a design artifact. So we can experience, or we can research someone's experience with a design artifact by asking them to tell us about their experience, or we can observe their experience. But a third way is by asking someone to make something that pertains to their experience. And so one of the theories of this method is that by asking someone to make something, we might access insights that uh, would not otherwise be revealed if we simply ask them to talk to us about it. So it's trying to access uh, the creativity that is inherent in all of us and draw out deeper insights about an experience through that, that act of creating. So that was one way that I brought design into this space. And then the second way is that I looked to the field of design and to the literature, and I tried to find useful concepts that I could bring to that relationship between the court and its users. And I settled on this semantic design theory. So, um, and I found that this theory could help conceptualize that relationship quite, quite well. So semantics often um, speaking to meaning, what is the meaning that an artifact has? And semantic design focuses on the different meanings that an artifact like a court can have to the different communities that interact with it. And one of the advantages of viewing uh, or focusing on meanings is that when we look at a court from any one perspective, it might appear to have one fixed meaning. But um, if we step back and look at the communities around it and acknowledge that there's a web of different meanings, different layers of meaning and throughout that artifact, um, we can start to take perhaps a more detailed or more nuanced view of, of what that court means to different communities around it not necessarily only those who use the court, um, but those that have some kind of interaction or some kind of um, influence on that, that court. So I found that theory quite useful, um, particularly in this Māori land court space. And the theory itself comes from Klaus Krippendorf. The role of the designer when thinking about the semantic design theory is to work with stakeholders to make a design artifact make the maximum sense possible uh, to those who have a stake in it. So we're trying to increase, we're trying to increase the meaning that an artifact or a court has. So those are the two ways I applied design in this space. And I found, just to give you an example um, of this creative research method, I asked my participants to complete a workbook over five days. I had them produce um, some collages with images that I had supplied them. Um, various exercises relating to their experience in the court or what they hoped that that might look like. And then I met with each of them and, and asked them to talk to me about what they'd made. Now, I think that this method had some value and may have generated insights that I would not have obtained had I just asked participants to, to talk to me. So just done a traditional interview. And just to give one example of that, um, one of my participants drew me this image of a koru, which in Māori culture represents growth, um, and that koru is in, in a net. So she, um, through using the court, had learned a lot about her Māori land and also about her Māori identity, hence the koru. But when she found out how constrained she was and what she could do with that land, um, she felt limited, and so that's represented by the net. And I found this um, quite a creative, um, a creative response, 
And she said to me, I wondered how much I was going to tell you, um, but it was an emotional journey and completing the workbook brought back how new it all was. So I, I took from that or I suggest that this um, is evidence of the fact that perhaps had I just spoken to her and not asked her to complete these exercises in advance, I may not have got um, the insights that I did. And in terms of the semantic design theory and how that helped me in uh, understanding that relationship between the court and its users, it helped me in that I was able to identify three different categories of people who interact with the court. So we have our existing users, owners of Māori land who are engaging with the court, applying for various orders, and often on behalf of other landowners who don't approach the court. So those are what I call existing users. I was also able to identify another group, which I called future users. These are descendants of current Māori landowners who aren't technically yet owners themselves, but one day will become owners. They will um, need to apply to the court to have the interests of their parent uh, passed down to them formally. Um, so those are what I call the future users. And then the non-users. So these are Māori landowners who are not engaging with the court at all. Their interests are not being represented before the court and they may not really know what the court is about or what purpose it serves. Um, without the semantic design theory, without being encouraged to step back and, and think about the network of, of, of meanings in the court, I might only have focused on this first category, um, people who are actually actively going to the court. But I suggest that we also need to think about what meaning the court holds for people like me, who one day will need to succeed to the interests of a parent in Māori land, and people who are not engaged at all. How can we um, make the court have more meaning for those people? Because ultimately, this is really important to the functions the court performs and the purpose of, of having this category of statutory land is to, to encourage people to engage with that. Um, and to see that as being significant to their lives and, and their identities. Um, so in conclusion, I would suggest that if you're interested in legal design, um, these methodologies which are based in creating could be useful. Um, time is key, so um, people need time to ruminate. I wasn't able to get my participants together and do a facil facilitation type exercise, but that is something that um, would be a worthy direction to explore further. And if we're thinking about the accessibility of a court generally, we might begin by making explicit the web of meanings that are held in that court by the different communities interacting with it. So moving from use to meaning, I suggest, um, could be a really, a really valuable space to explore um, building on that semantic theory of design. Um, so that's all I'll say for now, and um, I'll pass it on to um, Leanne now. Namahi. You're good to go to the end, but you're on mute. That might be helpful if I take that off. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of the land of which I'm on today. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and emerging, I pay my respects to any Aboriginal people and First Nations people that are listening today. And I would like to acknowledge that um, our land has never been ceded. Um, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a global audience today and encourage everyone to learn what land and country of the Indigenous people you're actually standing on today. So my name's Leanne Carter. I'm a Radri and Noongar woman. I am the statewide community justice programs leader at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. I've been at VALVES uh, for the last 10 years and my background is mostly in complex needs and case management. Um, however, at present, I'm managing extensive community justice programs across the state of Victoria. And in that, um, also, I was recently appointed as a non-executive director to the board, uh, Victorian Board of Mental Health, uh, which is an extremely um, big area that I'm quite passionate about. So the organisation I work for um, was set up in 1973 as a result of the lack of 
under-representation and a lot of people presenting at court unrepresented. We provide free legal advice across the state of Victoria to, um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons, First Nations persons. We uh, currently have a criminal practice, a civil practice, a family law practice. We have a program called Belit Nalu, which is a practice specifically for children and young people. And we have what's called the We're Away practice, which focuses on cases of uh, that deal with deaths in custody matters and police misconduct. In addition to the legal services, we also have our policy and advocacy. And VALS offer a, um, a large range of supports, um, including within our criminal justice areas, um, our client service officers who are First Nations, and they assist community members in navigating the legal system, uh, providing really practical assistance in having warrants executed, being able to get to court, making meetings, um, breaking down the barriers and the jargon that quite often exists between the criminal justice system and our community members. And one of the most important programs um, at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service is our client notification system. It is a 24 hour uh, program that runs 365 days a year. And what that program entails is police are actually legislated and required to contact our service when a Aboriginal or a, a Torres Strait Islander person has been taken into custody. And as a result of that, we do extensive welfare checks on persons from the time that they are booked in and arrived at a police station until the time they are either moved to a prison or let out of that particular police station. So, for example, um, during the COVID period, we had someone that was in custody on 11 day. Um, they were coming up to their 11th day. And during that time, I'd actually jumped on shift and realised that I was doing the 74th welfare check on that particular person who'd been in custody during those 11 days. And to give you an idea, when we call through, we obviously, we try and speak to the client. Um, we speak to the informant, we speak to family members, we speak to people's loved ones to ensure them that we're checking in and that, you know, which check police are doing the right thing. So if someone's coming down um, from substances and things like that, we'll inquire about what uh, withdrawal packs and things like that are going to be provided to that person in custody. And to give you an example of the volume of that particular work, during the 2021 period, we actually received 11,850 notifications. Now, as a result of those 11,850 notifications of persons in custody, we made 65,902 contact calls and welfare calls. And that's a significant amount, particularly given that we've got people that are often come to our service that are interstate, that are very disconnected, that don't have family here to ensure that someone is on the line, checking in on them regularly and ensuring that the processes are followed is obviously all for the purposes of reducing deaths in custody. And that's was one of the initiatives, that particular program that came out of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. Now, before I get further into my presentation, I just want to um, give a content warning that I may be discussing some content that is um, traumatic or around self-harming, and I would encourage anyone to actually seek any counselling assistance or any um, further, you know, further support that they may need. So I was thinking about how do we deliver culturally safe and design culturally safe programs? And I think in order to do that, the most fundamental thing is you need to understand who you're trying to design that program for. Who, who are you actually trying to provide a service for? Because in Australia, our First Nations um, people are rightly sceptical of any particular programs that are designed or implemented for the benefit of them. Given that we've had over 230 years of a colonial history within this country, that includes 
genocide, sinner simulation and segregation policies, and even our own Prime Minister uh, denying that there was slavery within our own country and the extreme disadvantage as a result of those impacts that exist today and the intergenerational trauma. We were not allowed to be citizens until 1967. We are currently the most incarcerated population within the world. We've got an age of criminal responsibility of 10. The recommendations that were created as a result of many, many deaths in custody have not been implemented today. And sadly, we still have people dying in custody as a result of the failures of programs and a service delivery that was set up and designed to actually engage with us, but with no consultation around that. So that sort of made me think, well, what sort of key factors are actually needed within driving this? And for us, it's it's around self-determination. In order to you know, improve any access to any cultural um, appropriate services and designing any particular programs, that are intended to work with First Nations people. First, you want to have to understand the culture and the barriers that circumvent the access to that particular justice. So, you know, I'd ask each of you today to question, you know, who are the First Nations people that you're wishing to provide a service to? And does your organisational culture, uh, culture within your organisation actually support the inclusion of the First Nations people and how? And, you know, is your is your service organisation actually capable of adjusting your practices to, you know, to incorporate the cultural differences and the local cultural differences? Because we are an extremely diverse people uh, within our own community. So what may be an issue within one community is not necessarily an issue for another community. And, you know, what relationship do you have? How many organisations do you know of within your area? How many do you have partnerships or engage with? And what levels and experience and expertise do you actually bring to the table? What value? And these are the sort of questions I think that, you know, any organisation or any partnership needs to think about seriously. Are you trauma-informed? You know, what does trauma-informed practice mean to you? Because often, you know, as we know, these programs that are set up, they don't communicate, they don't engage, they don't consult. And it's not, you know, they do not, one size does not fit all. And we know that. So, you know, any programs that do, you know, are created for um, or with, and that's the key, um, should be community led. They should be led by the community who have that decision-making control and responsibility for the design and implementation of that program. First Nations people need control over every aspect of that particular program and how that's designed, modelled and implemented and have control over the decision making that actually impacts on everyday lives of our people in our communities. That's absolutely essential for our self-determination and locally led um, programs are more likely to be engaged with because people People have a say, they have a say over what's going to impact on them. They trust their community members and they're more likely to take responsibility of the decisions that are made around their communities. So it should be understand that in order for any success of any First Nations program, that we measure what is success very differently to what you may measure success as. So our success might be getting someone to court um, whereas your success may be the outcome of the court matter, whereas we're dealing with the frontline issues before we even get to what success and those, you know, what the purpose of those programs are. So there's got to be some flexibility in the thinking and any program that needs to be driven has to be done in a very culturally safe space and holistic, you know, holistic and relational because we base our relations on our social emotional well-being, on our connections, on our community. And it's not individual. It is community driven. And one thing, you know, like within the programs, some of the programs that we actually um, have, one is our Belit service that was set up for young people as a result of young people being taken from youth detention centres and placed in adult prisons. 
And that's where community said, we actually need more for our young people. This isn't good enough. And that's where we've driven that legal service and provide that legal service for young people in a regional location. And we're hoping to obviously expand this and within our metro location to empower young people to make decisions and to have autonomy over their own lives. Quite often programs are set up, um, for example, um, programs set up for domestic violence, but they fail on every occasion to take into account the intersectionality, which is actually key in our lives in order to determine, are we going to use your service? What's the purpose of your service? And our intersectionality of who we are as First Nations people interacts in every part of our lives. And, you know, there's not one area of our life that is not impacted on the fact that we are First Nations people. So the young persons program that we've got set up is very trauma informed, is based on a model and it's through a cultural lens. And as I said, it is tailored towards all the needs of young uh, First Nations people. And that particular program, um, you know, has received a lot of really positive feedback from the judiciary as a result of um, the fact that the young person is given a caseworker, they're able to be supported throughout the entire process and linked in with referrals as a pathway afterwards. And that's the problem is a lot of times communities and partners come in, they want to build a program, but they don't want to actually commit or properly resource that program, which is another big issue. And another um, program that I want to touch on that we run is the We're Away program. Now, that particular program runs on donations and it was established after the Black Lives Matter movement, obviously because, you know, as we know, it was said that different soil, same story. So our voices have not been heard for a very long time within this space. And the We're Away program in particular gives voice and gives representation to the families of people who have died in custody and those that have suffered as a result of police misconduct. And um, a large, as I said, a large number um, of donations we actually received from community and allies in the wake of the protests because it was pretty clear that they were what community wanted us to focus on. They wanted us to focus on the justice issues that were impacting on them. And we we're always um, already represented, you know, families within the coronial process, and um, they are working very closely to um, improve some of the matters within the coronial court. And that includes, um, you know, the representation, the cultural processes that take, take place when someone passes away. And, you know, the smaller things about having, having the cultural safety within the court space, particularly within a coronial setting, to know that the families are going to be heard because quite often we know that families can't even afford to travel to coronial matters and things like that. Um, you know, just finally, I'd, I'd just like to finish and say, you know, when we're talking about culturally safe um, you know, services and they're significant. A recent report from the Coroner's Court of Victoria actually showed that there has been a 75% increase of suicides within Victoria in the past 12 months, whilst the general population has been decreasing, a 75% increase. And it begs the question, where's the national outcry? We've still got people dying in custody. It, it was recognised that self-harm and suicide is, you know, um, is a reality of someone being placed in a system where we are so in, over-incarcerated. And yet, you know, we've now got a 75% increase. And when the coroner's court started to actually dig into what was the cause of this, it was not covid it was substance issues, it was homelessness, but one of the biggest factors was a lack of access to services. And what they found was 75% of those deaths of people that died, they had had contact with the criminal justice system within a 72 hour period prior to their deaths. And that begs questions. It's, it's not good enough. So, you know, I ask you all to remember that when you are 
thinking about creating a program, wanting to implement changes, wanting to do things, that community consultation and embedding our culture within every aspect and giving us ownership over that is so significant. It's about self-determination, but it is also fundamentally about our human rights and about us having a voice in what happens to us. And that's that's where I'll end my, um, my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne, for that uh, very powerful presentation. And thank you to all of our presenters, to Karen and Michiata. I might ask you to put on um, your videos, please, all of our presenters, so that we can um, have a bit of a discussion. Um, and I, um, I can't see any questions at the moment in the Q&A panel. So if, the, if you do have a question, we have 15 minutes or so, and I would uh, love, to, uh, love to, to have them. But in the meantime, um, I'll, I'll, I'm very happy to, to ask my own questions and, and offer my own reflections. Firstly, again, just to thank all of you from uh, for the beautiful perspectives that you all offered. Each of your presentations were spoken from the heart and um, we have so much to learn uh, from each of the jurisdictions that are represented here. Each of you provided us with calls to action and, um, and, and things to take away. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, we, we have some questions coming up at the moment. Um, which I will go to now. Um, Leanne is asking, what is the best way to engage marginalised groups in research? Um, so I don't know whether there's a, a particular panel member who would like to answer this one. From your own experiences, what are the principles that are important when, um, when doing research with First Nations or Indigenous people? Would someone like to take that? Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I'll just say a little bit about a project that I'm working on. So I'm working on a project um, in partnership with an Indigenous Friendship Centre here in Ontario, Canada, the Sarnia Lambton Indigenous Friendship Centre. And they approached myself and my colleague, Professor Carmela Murdaka, because they are engaged with the Indigenous Persons Courts there in uh, the city of Sarnia and Walpole Island First Nation. And they wanted to engage in a research project to determine what is working well with the Indigenous Persons Courts and then what also could be improved. And so we talked about, you know, how we would go about this and, you know, what would be the research methodology that we would use. And what we finally came to was that we couldn't come up with a methodology ourselves, that we needed to take a step back and start at a step even before the project itself and have a kind of pre-project. And the pre-project was to go to the community and ask them what methodology they want. So that's what we're working on right now. And we've been um, doing it for a couple of years now and there's um, a number of rounds that we're going through, right? So first we go to the community and um, just ask them, what is your, your feedback in terms of how do you want us to engage in a research project with you? We're in the process of writing that up now and then we're gonna go back to them, give them the draft and ask, did we get it right? Or did we misunderstand anything? You know, a chance for them to give feedback. So um, my suggestion is just to be as responsive and engaged with the community as possible. Let them design the research project for you. Um, and might I just add after that, I think Karen's hit it on the head there and, you know, so many times our First Nations are across the world are studied and researched and, you know, I think one of the most fundamental things is you need to understand the protocols and the processes of that particular, um, you know, that particular community that you want to research because quite often there, you know, there are those processes and those protocols and those um, identified people within that community that you really need to speak to and um, firstly. So, you know, I think that's the starting point. Thank you. Um, 
and um, I can see that there are there are questions. There are also comments. With thanks to the speakers for your for your insightful and powerful um, presentations. Um, there's a question from Zoe who is interested in um, determining measures of success when implementing culturally aware design. Leanne, that's something that you touched on in your presentation about. Um, how we might start to think about what a measure of success might be. Would you like to, to start? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a sort of broad one. It's a bit like, um, I'll give you an example. Recently, I've been, well, I've been doing a lot of work with Victoria Police. And more recently, we were looking at the implementing some of the family, the local family violence protocols. And I said to them that in order for, to know if these protocols are working and that police are following, you know, proper, proper processes and engaging with the protocols when you're dealing with our mob, you know, with family violence matters, we need to have some measurable outcomes. And of course, police sort of have this, oh no, we don't need KPIs. <laughs> and it's like, oh no, I think you do. And um, so they said, look, you know, um, oh, I suppose reducing family violence is one way of it. And I said, yeah, and I suppose another way to look at it would be not just, you know, the reduction of the number of family violence, but how about how many referrals your police officers are making to other services? How about how many, you know, um, services you're starting to engage with within the community? What's the measure of that? You know, so I think when we're talking about the measure of success, it's what's the purpose? Is the purpose, for example, in this situation, um, reducing family violence, absolutely. But below that, um, for community, it would be other things like um, creating safe spaces, creating proper referral processes, you know, all the really practical things that sort of sit behind that. And it's a bit like what I said, um, you know, lawyers can stack up their, um, the data around how many people they had going to court this month, whereas ours is how many we chased down to get to court this month, how many visits we did to the house, how many phone calls we may have had. So, you know, our measure of success may be we actually got that person to court, you know what I mean, before anything else is actually done. So I think it's, it's creative and it's flexible and um, so, you know, for me, it's working out what do you actually want to achieve and then engaging and having, um, you know, having that conversation with First Nations people because um, quite often we, as I said, don't look at things individualistic. We look at things very holistic within our community. So it's a very different focus. Thank you, Leanne. Um, would, would anyone else like to add to that or are you happy to, to let that stand? Okay, great. Um, I've got a, a, a question, a lovely question from Simon, um, who asks, what, to what extent does and should culturally sensitive principles of justice design be integral as part of a, a general legal education? So for instance, should law students be required to have acquired some exposure in this area as part of a law degree or before being admitted to legal practice? So this is a, a, a like asks actually some really big questions about the way that we're educating our our law students um, and whether it equips them in legal practice to be able to approach uh, diverse First Nations, Indigenous, um, other groups in ways that um, are culturally sensitive and culturally safe. I imagine that we have different approaches to this in, in each of our jurisdictions. And I have to say, as a researcher myself, it is such a, uh, I've always wanted to just do exactly this to get a Canadian perspective, a New Zealand perspective and an Australian perspective in the same room. Because although, as um, Leanne says, we're on different soil, we have overlapping concerns and, and we can learn so much from each other's approaches. So I'm wondering whether um, our academics from other jurisdictions might give us some insight about how this um, is dealt with from in your um, in your home countries in relation to equipping our lawyers of the future um, to deal in culturally safe or culturally sensitive ways um, with with First Nations people.
Yeah, I'm happy to, to start first, if you like. Um, so in Canada, at least re recently, uh, our answer to that question is primarily in the affirmative. And the impetus for that was the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was released in 2015. And as part of that report, the commission issued 94 calls to action. And two of those calls to action relate directly to mandatory training for law students and lawyers in Indigenous law. So the laws of Indigenous peoples, as opposed to state laws that affects Indigenous people. And so since 2015, many law schools across the country have been picking up that, that mantle, that call to action. Um, and I've worked at two of them. So um, before Osgood, I was a faculty member at the Bore Alaskan Faculty of Law at Lakin University, which is a new law school in uh, Canada. And we started with a tripartite mandate focused on Indigenous legal issues, um, natural resources and environmental law, and small town and small firm practice. And so the program at Lakehead um, right from the outset had three mandatory courses focused on Indigenous legal topics. So one on the laws of Indigenous peoples themselves, one on state laws that applies to Indigenous people, and then an experiential course on um, perspectives of Indigenous people. And at Osgood, where I am now, just as of 2018, we introduced a uh, degree requirement. So all students in our law program, in our Juris Doctor program, in order to graduate, must take at least one course within a basket of courses that focus on Indigenous and Aboriginal legal issues. So Aboriginal is the term that we use for state law applied to Indigenous people. So that's a, a, a brief summary of what's happening in Canada. Mihiata? Thanks. Um, yeah, I can speak briefly to what's happening in Aotearoa. Um, and I think we're probably on a track that's similar to what Karen has spoken about, but maybe a couple of years behind. Um, so the, the New Zealand Council for Legal Education, which sets the requirements of the law degree, is contemplating and, and probably right on the cusp of introducing a, a requirement for the compulsory law uh, papers in the degree, which are, you know, those big papers on tort and contract um, and public law to include the teaching of, and the wording is yet to be determined, but something like Maori legal concepts or um, Maori law needs to be taught into those courses. Um, so that's um, on the horizon for us, uh, all universities here, all law, law schools here in New Zealand. Um, and so uh, as a Maori legal academic, I, myself and my colleagues are contemplating on how can we how can we do this in an appropriate way? And at the moment, the framework we're taking is if we think of uh, the bidural teaching of what, what we might call state-based law alongside Maori law, um, that is one limb of what ought to be um, a kind of three-pronged approach. We need a bidural, but also bicultural and bilingual environment in which to teach these concepts, um, which may mean that students need to be taught about colonization, um, about the Treaty of Waitangi. They need to be able to pronounce Maori words um, um, correctly, and so do their lecturers. So um, we're trying to approach it in a, in a, in a three-pronged way at the moment. But um, yes, it's looking like it's going to be a compulsory part of the legal education here soon. Thank you. Um, and uh, are there, there are so many lovely questions in the Q&A that I uh, want to make sure in the few minutes that we have left that we get to some of them. Um, um, Dr. Liz Curran has asked a question that I, I think it, it works really nicely as a, as a comment or an, as an addition to the discussion as well. Um, Liz has, has, um, is reflecting on, on Karen's discussion of, um, of project design and allowing uh, a, um, a, an Indigenous led design of research projects and is commenting on the fact that um, there is a also a requirement perhaps to allow for adjustment and sort of a, a kind of reflective um, or iterative process of designing um, the research so that if it changes to allow for change or for, for sort of um, 
uh, adjustment as, as it goes. Um, is, does anyone want to make a quick comment about the, the need for that, for not just designing it at the beginning in a um, collaborative or Indigenous-led way, but for, for the need to do it um, in a kind of reflective and uh, allowing for change through that process? We, we might actually take it as a comment just at the moment and, and bring in some other things. And then I, I might ask you to sort of say what, what, you, um, what, what feels most pressing for you before we close at the end. Um, there is a, another comment that um, about what good might come of bringing culturally sensitive practices into mainstream justice. So um, can, the question is, can mainstream justice learn from these practices for the good of the fundamental needs of, of people involved in, in justice processes, such as the need for fair and just outcomes to wrongs? And again, I think that works beautifully as a, as a, as a comment, in a sense, as well as as a question about how we might do that. Um, and I think that, you know, Karen's discussion around the, 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 the baseline conceptual differences in worldview um, between approaches to being and, and, to, and therefore to, to justice as well um, is pertinent here. Um, but also the, um, you know, the good that might come from designing justice processes in a particular way for all, all um, participants in, in the processes. And um, so I think, I think you'll, you'll probably find agreement here on the panel, but I, again, I'll come at the end um, to, to ask for your reflections on that. I see we're at time and that people might need to go, but, but we'll just get to the end of this and, and invite some final reflections from panel members for the next few minutes. The last question is from um, Carrie, who works in a, at an administrative tribunal and is wondering um, about how to uh, inculcate more culturally appropriate processes by changing the process entirely rather than um, tweaking existing processes. Does anyone know of a process that does not engage the traditional trappings of adversarial administrative hearings? So those are our three final large questions or comments. Um, panel members. How, what would you like to tap? I might give each of you a couple of minutes um, to close. And Mihiata, you look ready. <laughs> you look ready to go. Thank you so much. Um, lots of food for thought there. And I do have thoughts on all three of those things and I'll try and kind of bring them together coherently. So, I mean, in short form, I think, yes, there is, there is good to come from thinking about, um, you know, if we think about designing a service that's appropriate to a particular community of use, um, and culturally appropriate, um, everyone brings their unique culture to these services. It's not just that Indigenous peoples have culture and we need to design for Indigenous communities. Um, although obviously Indigenous communities have specific needs and histories and contexts that need close attention and careful thought. But generally, I think if we think carefully about the culture that a person brings to this experience, then we ought to be designing for that. Obviously, there are resource implications to the extent to which you go to try and make a fit for purpose service. We also need to make the courts efficient. Um, but I do believe that if you think about, if we think about the designing a service in a way that's culturally appropriate, it has implications that go far beyond our Indigenous communities. And, and if we can, can leverage off that, it, it, it probably would, um, would be for the good of everyone, I think. Thank you. Um, Karen, would you like to, to go next? Sure. Um, so just starting with the first comment, I absolutely agree with the value of having an iterative approach when designing research methodologies with Indigenous communities. Um, I think that that is really key to being you know, truly engaged and participatory with, with an Indigenous community. Um, in terms of, I guess, the second two questions, so bringing culturally sensitive practices into a mainstream process and then is it possible to fully avoid um, the trappings of a, a conventional administrative hearing and, and truly engage in a, a fully um, indigenous process? Um, so, 
you know, my, my thesis was that attempting to bring in practices to an already existing mainstream process is going to result in some distortions. There might still be great value in doing that. And I don't want to um, shun you know, an incremental approach, but we need to be aware that there are going to still be um, potential pitfalls. In terms of, at least for an Anishinaabe process, I talked about how the force of law is persuasive, right? It comes from internalizing the law. And so what that means is that for a truly Anishinaabe process, there is no external decision maker. So any process that has some external decision maker enforcing a decision on someone else is going to fall short of truly engaging with persuasive compliance. Um, so what does it look like then to not have an external decision maker? Well, there's this great article about the Muskrat Dam First Nation in Ontario, and it describes members of Muskrat Dam talking about their processes for dispute resolution. And one thing they talk about is that if there's someone who's been causing harm in the community, a possible, a possible solution is for that person to go and live with the chief's family for like six months or a year. And when I read that, that just blew my mind, right? Like how different is that from someone making a pronouncement in a matter of minutes, this is your sentence, this is your, this is the decision versus someone going to live with the chief for six months to a year, right? To truly internalize how to live in a good way, how to live a flourishing life. Um, so to me, that just really illustrates the divide between the two worldviews. Thank you. So fascinating. Leanne, you got the last word. I was on me to myself. I've just got it down on a few things while I was thinking. Um, one, I think when we're looking at implementing, um, you know, when we've, when we've already got systems in place, like infrastructures in place, it's, it's always a bit of a struggle, uh, particularly to, um, you know, change anything, <laughs> change anything on tradition or, you know, or a system that's so adversarial. I think one of, some of the very quick learnings that we're taking at the moment is we've got a pilot project called the Aboriginal Community Justice Reports. And the idea of that project is to be able to present to court, um, you know, be able to present these really comprehensive reports. Now, these particular reports are modelled on the Galadriel reports in Canada, but are also very tailored to our people and our First Nations people here. So what we're trying to encapsulate within these reports is um, who that person is, what their connections are, what was going on in that person's life at the time of the, you know, of um, what's brought about this offending, what was going on within the community, but not just looking at the individual, but providing the court with a cultural perspective on who is this person culturally, where are they connected, who is their community, etc. And we're hoping that will actually have an influencing on the way that sentencing is, because as we know at the moment, the sentencing reports that are given up are not from a cultural perspective. They give no cultural insight into who the person is standing in front of, you know, that magistrate, for example. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure who it was, um, I might have been with you, uh, talking about talking circles, or someone was speaking about talking circles, I think, at the start. And I think if we're looking at alternative ways of, um, a different way to view things without saying that we're going to throw the entire system over because that wouldn't go down too well, um, is to also look at our justice reinvestment programs and our um, programs that we've currently got within our communities that are actually working and having options for, um, you know, those ongoing uh, diversions from the mainstream, you know, justice system as well. Like we've got Koori courts here, um, you know, that is sat with elders and, you know, sit with the magistrate at a round table with the informant, with the prosecutor, um, you know, to manage matters. But those are also, you know, you can't access that unless there's a plea of guilty. There's certain offences that still can't be held within that. So, you know, we still sit within that system, but I think having um, the ability to have that flexibility and a different way of thinking, um, like going home with the chief is an awesome idea. Like that, that is a very different way of looking at things. But I mean, 
you know, if things aren't working now, um, then, you know, they do need to change and perhaps, you know, changing them fundamentally from the ground up is something that we need to work on, but that's going to take some time as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for, um, for uh, being with us, for sharing your wisdom and for bringing us so much to think about from, from each of uh, the perspectives that you're working from. And, um, and uh, I want to particularly thank um, Leanne for all of the powerful discussion around the self-determination being absolutely central to any, any design, any processes. Uh, it really kind of brought all of the discussion together in, in a really meaningful way. So thank you to Karen Michiata and Leanne. And I can see that, that Lynn is here to see us off. And thank you, Melanie. Um, I'll just uh, once again reiterate our thanks to Karen Drake from Osgood Hall, Mihiata Perini from University of Otago, and to Leanne Carter from the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. And of course, to Melanie Schwartz from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. It has been an absolutely riveting conversation and the parallels and the differences and the ways forward I have, uh, to use your, your phrase, Karen, had my mind blown in very many ways in terms of both um, what I see and what we do as uh, the Victoria Law Foundation also. So I appreciate your inputs, all of you, very much indeed. Really rich. And uh, for those people who perhaps didn't see or hear all of it, don't worry, there's a recording coming your way if you're registered. And if you want to slide over now to the COVID and courts conversation, then just go to the program and click on the session link and that will take you directly in. Thank you to all of you for coming to, to this part of our international forum. And we look forward to your attendance again, either for the next session or tomorrow's sessions. Don't forget there's another three coming up tomorrow. Thank you again to all of our speakers and go well.